All right, so I'm excited to be with uh, Dr. Guabo Wang from UC Davis. He's one of my uh, favorite researchers in the field. I've been uh, influenced by his thinking, his insights. I remember in 2008, he had a paper published on direct uh, uh, reconstruction of parametric PET images, which really touched me and actually made me uh, change the sort of a research scheme in, in, in my own lab and, and move in this exciting space. So so uh, thank you, Guabo, for, for being here. Thank you, Armin, uh, so much uh, for those uh, kind words. And uh, it's, uh, and also thank, thank you for this great opportunity here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So so I'm excited because you're, you're talking about two very important frontiers. Um, you know, kinetic modeling has been there, but it continues to be here and, it, and it's moving in very exciting directions. Um, and total body now also being a major frontier and these things coming together and, and, and you taking us to that space and talking about it. So, 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 so thank you. And let's, 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 let's go, let's go ahead. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, total body pattern kind of modeling and uh, its uh, potential applications. And uh, so now we are quite familiar with total body PET and uh, because it brings uh, uh, a, a very high photon detection uh, sensitivity and also enables simultaneous dynamic imaging of the entire body. And uh, so here shows uh, the total body explorer as an example. And uh, now we have uh, uh, several uh, pad, total body pad systems with a different uh, uh, actual field of view. So here shows three examples. So one is from on um, this UI actually U Explorer has a actual field of view of um, nearly a uh, two meter. The mm -hmm. middle one is a uh, pen pad with uh, a extended field of view of uh, 140 uh, centimeter. And right. the right one is from Siemens uh, Quadra. It's a, uh, yeah, about one, mean, one or six centimeter. I think this is great. I guess some, some call these long axial field of view PET scanners also, because strictly speaking, some of them may not be total body, but I think you're you're calling any of them total body, I guess, as long as they're more than a meter or so, correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so so what are some of the applications that that we could be expecting from these uh, these scanners? Yes, I think that's a great question. So uh, one big uh, potential uh, of for total body pad is for this uh, simultaneous dynamic imaging of the entire body. And so here, this slide shows one example from Explore. So now we are able to uh, produce uh, this very fine spatial temporal distribution yeah. of trace uptake in the entire body. So as you can see, we can see the clear uh, uh, time change of the trace uptake in the metastatic metastatic conditions. Right. Okay. So, so routinely we do, we don't do this, right? Routinely in the clinic, we do, you know, standard optic values, single time, you know, let's say, uh, uh, we're, we don't look at the evolution of the rate of pharmaceuticals routinely, but of course with total body scanners um, and dynamic whole body protocols, we can sort of look at these. So what, what, why, why are these important? What, why, why should we be looking at, um, the dynamic PET and the time course of radio pharmaceuticals. Yeah, so so with this uh, ability, so we are able to capture the full time cost and to as uh, in all these uh, different organs and of course in different metastatic lesions. So to answer your question, so this slide is directed about uh, tracer kinetic modeling to quantify uh, some physiologically important parameters. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, so here we have K1, K2, K3 parameters represented in different uh, uh, rate of transfer between different compartments. And with the uh, works of wise implementation, we are able to produce parametric images of these uh, different uh, uh, micro kinetic parameters. And of course, from these micro kinetic parameters, we are also are able to calculate some ma uh, macro kinetic parameters like uh, the net influx rate, the KI uh, right. for FDG. Which is a combination of these micro parameters. Um, That's correct. Yeah. So, I mean, so, some refer to, you know, SUV standard optic values as quantitative, but I think at best they're semi-quantitative. And, and what you're saying is that, you know, we're moving in, in a space where we could be looking at really physiologically 
meaningful parameters and that's really true quantitation in fact. Yes. And uh, I will show some examples mm -hmm. on these uh, points. Okay. And, and of course, trace kinetic modeling uh, itself is not new. It has a very long uh, research history. So what's the uh, unique benefit uh, that uh, total body pad has brought to uh, kinetic modeling? So here we summarize into two uh, aspects. So one, one is the improved sensitivity, which can make it more robust to estimate uh, kinetic parameters. Yeah. So this is very important if we uh, want to bring uh, kinetic modeling into clinical use and because this improves clinical uh, reliability. So then the sec secondly, so the improved sensitivity can also enable yeah. dynamic pad imaging with much higher temporal resolution. And for now, so at the, the, a normal temporal resolution is about five to 10 seconds per frame, but with the, the improved sensitivity uh, by total body pad scanners, so we are able to do like a one second per frame or even a sub second per frame. As which, is, which is mind, mind blowing to be able to do PET scans at only one second a frame, yeah. That's absolutely right. And that would allow us to propose, propose Probably some uh, physiologists that we had never had uh, mm. an opportunity to do. Okay, and then the second large point is about the total body uh, coverage, and it will uh, covers it will cover both uh, major blood pores and all organs simultaneously. So the ben this uh, allow us to like always have a good image derived input function. Yeah, and, I mean. Uh, I remember, um, you know, the struggle that we've had many times, like let's say in, in brain imaging, right? And, and, and in other applications, you know, how do you, of course people have come up with, uh, you know, reference tissue reference models and et cetera, but to actually find a blood pool, you know, the carotid arteries, there's lots of partial volume effects happening, right? So, but to actually have, for example, the heart in the field of view all the time, that could be very valuable. Yes, yes. And the total body coverage uh, also allows uh, full component modeling for all organs and of course for those metastatic lesions. Mm -hmm. So one benefit of this is, is uh, for total body quantification of those microkinetic parameters uh, for which I will also show yep. Yep. Uh, some examples. And uh, along with this benefit, uh, so, and you also mentioned uh, the the, the usefulness of image derived input function for brain imaging. So what's, there are also some uh, challenges associated with uh, total body kinetic modeling. Uh, so here I uh, separated them according to the key components of uh, tracer kinetic modeling, the blood input function, kinetic model, and tissue uh, TOCs and fitting. So basically the challenge, for example, for blood input function, we have time play mm -hmm. and dispersion crashing and uh, perhaps the, the need for modeling uh, modeling uh, dual blood supplies, for example, in the liver and the lung. Right. Yeah. And also for a lot of lung FDG tracers, we need to do more metabolite correction. And for kinetic model, so, and we perhaps need to select more, the best model for for different applications of different organs, and uh, also about what what's the uh, identifiability uh, of each uh, uh, kinetic parameters on the tissue TAC and fit inside. So, of course, the data set becomes huge, and uh, the motion effect becomes more uh, becomes more pro uh, problematic in the total body setting. And of course, conventionally, the local minimum is also a challenge. And uh, here also long scan duration for dynamic pad has been a concern. So- I remember, uh, uh, Guava, I remember, uh, you know, years ago, I, I used to work with a kinetic modeling person and he, he would tell me, don't call me a kinetic modeler. I said, why not? He said, because, you know, the, the pet data are so noisy that we can't really do fancy stuff. We just take, you know, a few models, simple models and, and you know, our hands are tied, but I think with what you're talking about with, with these new exciting increases in sensitivity and the quality of the image we're getting, we can actually do more advanced kinetic modeling. Yes, yes, that's correct. So these are all challenges, challenges but they are all opportunities for yeah. uh, technical development. 
Yeah. Uh, so here I'm just going to show uh, two examples on, yeah. on time delay correction and the model selection. So for time delay delay correction, so basically, so if we extract an a, a image derived input function from the left ventricle, so mm -hmm. that's uh, what we normally do. So we can get a, a TNC like this, but uh, actual arrival, uh, arrival of uh, uh, the blood, blood in a tissue, specific tissue region is maybe may look like this. So that's a time delay between these two locations. Yep. And uh, so we need to account, account for uh, this effect uh, if we want to do an uh, accurate quantification of those kinetic parameters. Uh, I'm not going to go into the uh, details of uh, the time delay correction, but try to show yeah. the impact of time delay correction on the KI image and uh, other micro parametric images. Well, one, so, could imagine, one could imagine that if you're adding one extra unknown in your fits, you know, uh, that might result in your images becoming perhaps a bit noisier because you have more parameters, right? Now that would like be something I would imagine might be happening. Though I guess I don't see it happening here, but maybe you can comment about that. Yeah, that's a great question. Every time when we add one more unknown parameters, so uncertainty is likely uh, increased. But just in this case, the because as shown on this slide, the, the left figure shows the uh, estimated time delay map from a real patient uh, scan. As you can see, the time delay value uh, is, uh, is quite large in some regions. It's up to like uh, 30 to 50 seconds. Mm. So with that large time delay, the associated bias to those kind of premise may uh, weigh the benefits of doing time delay question as compared yeah. to the potential increased uncertainty. Uh, yeah, the, the, that increase with, uh, that increase in contrast is uh, quite impressive. Yeah. Yeah. So this slide, the middle figure shows the KI without time delay question, and then the right uh, image shows the KI image with time delay question. As you wow. can see from the images, so the lesion contrast is increased a lot, not just for this uh, liver lesion, but also for uh, these two lesions that you can see from the images. Okay. And uh, of course, not just on the KI image, but also especially the time delay question uh, has a even larger impact on those uh, early kinetics quantification wow. like a VB and the KI. So as you can see from the comparison without time delay question and with time delay question, the image looks very different. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look at the VB and K1 image, uh, the right one ones uh, are, are more consistent with our understanding of the, the, the structure of the human uh, anatomy. Yeah. Like, very impressive. I mean, the, yeah. It, again, it's one of those things that we don't often even imagine trying to fit you're you're clearly having a very very active imagination and you're doing it and it's great yeah then the next uh, is i we can talk about a little bit on um, uh, model selection so conventionally uh we people like normally worked on uh, brain or heart so basically a fixed model is commonly used for this organ specific uh, applications. But in the context of total body parametric imaging, we have many different organs and the, each organ may follow a different uh, uh, compartment, compartment mo model. And mm -hmm. giving you one example uh, to demonstrate this. So this, the left uh, uh, image shows a model selection map, uh, works wise uh, performed for, for a uh, patient scan. So, and here we have three candidate model and the, the A is uh, the commonly used uh, two tissue, the E reverse for two tissue model. Yeah. And then the B is one T model, which does not include K3 parameter. And also we have also what is called the zero T model, which has only the, the input function. So, so using the AIC criterion you mentioned on the left, you, you select which model is the best. And this yes. is actually quite interesting. I remember years ago when I was fitting the heart, right? I would just mm -hmm. block the blood pool simply because fitting the blood pool with like a one or two tissue compartment might give you very weird uh, numbers. Whereas blood pool is blood pool. It's just a zero, 
zero T as you're calling it, right? But I would just yeah. block it. You're you're letting the model actually sell it, you know tune itself and or select the right model for for the right place. Yes, that's a very good point. And I'm actually going to show some examples along that direction. Great. So, so here's a uh, one example. Uh, showing the impact of model selection on total body KI imaging. So mm. the left one shows uh, the result without model selection, which means we only use a 2TI model. So as you can see, the the, the lead lesions is shown clearly, but we also have some uh, a big hotspot in this blood region. Yeah. And after the model selection, actually that one uh, goes away. Interesting. And so that's potentially uh, uh, indicate so this uh, hot spot is a just an artificial one caused yeah. by the the two TI model. So this may be uh, even further uh, shown in the uh, there it is heart yeah. region. So yeah. normally this is what you just talk about. So we have a lot of uh, like uh, artificial high value in those uh, like left left ventricle or other major blood pools. But after model selection, we can get a clear visualization of uh, the myocardium. Exactly. Yeah. So that may give yeah. us some potential applications using uh, parametric imaging for for heart disease. That's great. Great. Uh, so of course we there's still other uh, challenges. So, but despite those. Uh, still existing challenges, we are able, now we are able to pre, uh, generate uh, uh, very nice uh, parametric images for different uh, kind of parameters. Like here we have a net influx rate KI, FDG uh, delivery rate K1, fractional blood volume VB, and also volume of distribution V0. And uh, as compared to this uh, uh, clinical standard SUV image, you can see they look very uh, quite different. Yeah, so 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 there is no doubt in my mind that the images on the right, you know, are significant and they're they're adding information. So so from a single PET scan, instead of just generating a single SUV image, we're we're generating you know images of the macro parameters or even the micro parameters as you show right. But I guess one of the catches has been that the what you show on the right is often acquired at a longer duration of time. I guess mm -hmm. what you're showing is what over maybe a, up to over an hour. Is that what it is? Yes, that's correct. Right. So so clearly there's a lot of amazing information there, right? And and of course we have to look for the clinical applications. But do you have any thoughts about whether this duration can be shortened so to to make things more more feasible? Yes, and again that's also a great question, and uh, I believe that's uh, uh, some debates in the field whether yeah. that one hour duration is feasible for clinical use. I think that uh, my logic is here is uh, I think we should able we should try to identify the benefit first to see uh, what we can get from this uh, um, one one hour dynamic data, and based on that benefit, then we can try to uh, determine whether it's uh, feasible for clinical use. Because, like, if we can get like a very totally uh, different information, which is uh, very beneficial for clinical applications, then then I think even one hour is still doable. Because if you imagine like you have uh, two different tracers, right? It would require more than one hour to perform the two to start is but if you no, no, I get... mean, totally agree i think one of the tricks we've we've been using over the years you know when i was at uh, johns hopkins and also here at bc cancer agency is is to take the first patient of the day because there's more time at the beginning of the day yep. right and just have that patient scan for longer durations acquire accumulate this data and as a community i think we need to be accumulating and sharing these data and, and sort of arrive at i guess what you're saying arrive at 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 killer apps or whatever is, is 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 supposed to be transformational and then we could find solutions to shorten for example right yes yes i and i believe uh some groups are working on some uh, uh more practical clinical protocol for this uh, uh parametric imaging right right and uh of course, so with all these uh, like a multi-parametric imaging, 
uh, images. So what kind of benefit we may have? Okay. So yeah. here I'm using FDG as an example to to show like a two uh, points that we have been working on. So th the first one is uh, about comparison uh, between KI versus SUV. Mm -hmm. so the second one is uh, uh, what had been mentioned, uh, the micro canonical parameters, Great. for example, K1. Let's, let's see show what, some let's examples. See what you got. Yeah. So this slide shows uh, uh, FDG KI can be a, a more uh, sensitive biomarker than SUV in COVID mm -hmm. uh, engine. So, uh, so we did a pilot study, which uh, includes uh, about 13 uh, COVID patients within two months of uh, onset of COVID. COVID. And uh, so, uh, so this one shows a uh, KI parametric image of the total body of a, a COVID patient. And then this figure shows the uh, uh, box plot of a long SUV to differentiate the healthy subject group and the COVID-19 group. As you can see, so SUV was not able to differentiate uh, the two groups. So in comparison, so the if we yep. quantify the K Ki in the lungs, then we get uh, 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 this box plot on the right. Now you can see, so the long Ki can differentiate the two groups with a statistical significance. I guess, so this, strictly, strictly speaking, we don't need a total body scanner for this, right? We could do dynamic whole body, uh, even with a more conventional scanner, um, to try this. So people can try this even with that, right? Yes, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, but just like uh, in this case, uh, with the total body uh, scanning, so we are able to identify a change in the lung, right? But, but uh, so you need to make a hypothesis before that mm -hmm. if you only have a, like a, a conventional scanner. Right, you're saying, you're saying with a total body scanner, we could be looking at different things and, and even forming new hypotheses. Uh, uh, yes, that's as opposed that's to correct. have yeah. to a priori tune into a particular region and, and and asking very specific questions, right? Yeah. Then in this case, with total body pad scanner, so we are able to look at the brain, lung, liver, uh, bone marrow, spleen, yeah. all this stuff together, uh, before we can form yeah. a solid hypothesis to test. It's like a discovery ground for for many you know, interesting questions. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, that's the potential of total body pad for mm -hmm. studying systemic disease. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm still focused on KI. So the this slide is to show the improved uh, lesion contrast by KI image, uh, in cancer. So yeah, we we know that FDG is not uh, FDG pad is not used for uh, imaging liver lesions because uh, uh the the. FTG uptake in the liver is very high. So that makes the, uh, the contrast of uh, any lesions is very low. In, For example, in this case, yep. as you can see from the image. But when we look at the KI image, you can see the lesion contrast is, is improved a lot, yep. like from 1.6 to about 6, with slightly uh, increase in the background noise. OK. So this, and this very also comes yep. yep. yeah. That's great very consistent with all those reported uh, uh, increased lesion contrast by uh, whole body parametric imaging. Mm -hmm. So next uh, slide is more focused on the uh, micro parametric quantification. For example, so here I'm showing one example from K1 Im imaging of the COVID versus healthy subject, as you can see from the left side. So these two patients look very different according to the K, K1 values in the bone marrow, the spike bone marrow. So this definitely require a total body scanner to image the whole uh, uh, spine bone marrow. And in this case, uh, the FDG K1 uh, was able to differentiate the two groups, health subject versus COVID with a statistical significance. And of course, you may also want uh, the performance of a KI or SUV and uh, so this figure shows, uh, yeah, right. KI was not able to differentiate the two, two groups uh, near that uh, SUV. Uh, so this basically, 
in uh, a indication that uh, the potential application of uh, those micro parametrical quantification, because for example, here K1, a uh, Ki is basically a represents the overall glucose utilization. Yep. And it's a combination of those micro kinetic parameters like K1, K2, K3. And uh, with this uh, micro parametrical quantification, we are able to uh, target specific uh, mole molecular uh, process like a glucose okay. transport here as represented by FDGK1. So yep. that may provide, provide us with a new opportunity to differentiate uh, disease versus health. I mean, again, in the past, one reason people have hesitated to do that is simply because the images would become noisier when you had too many parameters that you have to fit. Whereas in KI, it's it's a bunch of parameters lumped into one. So fitting it might be a little bit more robust, but I guess with total body, we're really sort of revisiting all these, right? And, and see yes, 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 I, I, yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. And total body pad provides us a new opportunity to revisit all these kind of modeling stuff. Okay, uh, of course the, the FTG pad uh, uh, is mainly used for oncology applications and actually FTGK1 may have a potential to better detect brain tumors. Uh, so in addition, those uh, liver Imaging imaging, so FTG pad is also not used for uh, imaging brain tumors. This is because the uh, FTG uptake in normal brain is very high, as you can see from this SUV image. And there's actually a lesion there, but yep. the contrast between this lesion to the and the uh, uh, brain is very low. And uh, even on the KI image, the lesion contrast is improved, but still hard to be differentiated from the normal uh, brain, uh, brain values. Mm -hmm. But if we look at the K1 image, uh, the image appearance is totally different. This is because uh, K1 of those uh, normal brain regions is very low, but meanwhile K1 of tumors or lesions can be very high. And uh, that forms a new contrast for detecting uh, these lesions. And this actually confirmed on the CT image. Wow, that is quite impressive. Yes, so, so why is why is the K1 quite higher uh, in these tumors? So you're looking at, I guess, it's a combination of blood a combination flow of and blood flow and glucose, and glucose transporter transport. expression. Yeah. And uh, yeah. uh, glucose transport expressions is reported to be high in tumors as compared right. to normal tissues. So both of those, of course, contribute to K1, the blood flow and the glucose transport. So, so yeah, yeah. very yeah. impressive, yeah. I think my, uh, this slides, I would just show some, one example that combines the, the potential benefit of K and K1. Hmm. And uh, we know that uh, in, uh, for those cancer patients, uh, at least 30 to 40% of of those patients do not show uh, the myocardium clearly uh, on the SUV image as shown by these two examples. You cannot uh, see the myocardium clearly. So the uptake, the myocardial image. uptake, the contrast is just very low in, in, in these subset of patients. That's why you can't really distinguish, right? Between yes, yes. That's, uh, and yeah. So that's basically uh, because of the oncological FDG PET protocol which is quite different from those uh, from from what is used for cardiac FDG imaging, which uh, promotes muscle uptake. In this case, uh, because of fat team, that the muscle uptake is uh, suppressed. Is lower. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. But actually, when we look at the KI image, which mm -hmm. reflects the glucose metabolism, we are able to uh, get a quite good visualization of the myocardium. Mm -hmm. And now you can see uh, different patterns in these two patients. And uh, just do not forget, uh, we also have the K1 image, which represents the perfusion and the transport. And clearly, uh, the um, myocardium is also visualized. And mm -hmm. the, the K1 image shows a different pattern as compared to the K K image. So this potentially may provide a evaluating of for example, myocardial viability in this uh, cancer patient. 
and may have a potential application in uh, cardiotoxicity evaluation. Exactly, you're bringing out different different phenomena, perfusion, metabolism. Whereas you know conventionally we would have had to do multiple different tracers, right? You know, let's say do an FDG or a, and a you know a rubidium to separate these out, right? And but here from a single radiopharmaceutical just acquired in a unique way, we can actually extract these uh, phenomena. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is my last slice. Hmm. Um, uh, so yeah, list a few uh, topics that uh, I believe people in the field are working on. And yeah. uh, for example, uh, the first one is uh, a topic that uh, my group is working on, the high temporal resolution. As I mentioned, the, the yeah, total yeah. body pad with improved sensitivity can provide us a much higher temporal resolution. That actually open a a window for for testing some new kinetic model. And uh, one of our interests is to extract quantitative blood flow and also those uh, tracer specific transporter parameters from this so with high the, with the with the temporal data. resolution of PET becoming one order of magnitude better, I guess you, you, you can probe things you have never even looked into, right, with PET? Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and the second bullet is about what we uh, discussed, uh, discussed uh, slightly. So how could we get a more feasible clinical imaging protocols? Yeah, yeah. like shorter uh, durations yeah, with yeah. high quality. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's that's possible because I know people are working on it. And of course, for those long FDG tracers, um, metabol metabolite correction is uh, uh, desirable. And uh, this uh, becomes possible uh, by computational methods, for example, using the total body component modeling of different organs, because all of those share the same blood input function. Yeah. And, uh, I believe at least the, the Yale group is working on it. And uh, also in total body parametric imaging context, motion correction, uh, a lot of motion effect becomes more dominant in the parametric images. The motion correction is uh, needed to correct uh, those artifacts. And uh, perhaps you also notice that there's a, uh, a in growing interest on the total body organ network analysis and by using uh, the, the connectomy uh, map approach that that have been normally uh, explored in the brain field. But now with total body pad, uh, we have an opportunity to explore a similar thing in the total body context. Yeah. Yep, that's it. Yeah, but, I mean, very, very exciting. Thank you, Glover. These These are... Amazing. Thank you for taking us to, to this world and to your world and, and uh, generously sharing what, what you've been doing. And, um, you know, I, I share the excitement, I'm sure, with many people to, to see the kind of new questions that are popping up that we can actually investigate now that we were not able to even investigate in the past. Right. So so thank you very much for, for being here and uh, uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. And thank you for this great opportunity again. And Thank uh, you. yeah, I share. Thank you very much.